Let's now look forward to the next presentation. Professor Freitag is uh, from the discipline of philosophy, and I am very much looking forward to his presentation. He used to work in Constance, in Liverpool, in Texas, in Oxford, in Bern, in Heidelberg, Freiburg, and I only mentioned a few of these cities. In 2013, he's had a professorship in uh, the University of Freiburg for theoretical philosophy, and uh, ever since 2018, he's been a professor for theoretical philosophy and uh, linguistic philosophy at the university in Mannheim. His uh, research focus is on theoretical philosophy, and I'm very much looking forward to um, seeing how we can translate things uh, today in terms of corona, you know, um, the knowledge theories, uh, language theories, linguistic theories, but he's also looking at certain uh, aspects of practical uh, philosophy, like the metaphysics of norms. I'm looking forward to her presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Böhl, for these kind words of introduction. I'm very delighted to be with you, and I am also going to pick up on what Mr. Bandelow, my, my predecessor, said. He talked about the fear brain and the rational brain. I'm going to try and bring those two topics together, the two fields of rationality and fear. We've heard about it today. Fear or angst is one of the few German terms that exist in the English dictionary as well without any translation. So it is part of a very exclusive club of notions such as Weltschmerz, Kindergarten or Gesundheit. It's a very topical one, in particular in the south of the US, by the way. So whenever somebody sneezes, and uh, they're told Gesundheit. And you know that angst in, Ge in English also is called German angst. Uh, and it doesn't have a very sound and good reputation, and quite a rightly so, in part at least. So it goes back to the existential philosophers, and on the right you can see Mr. Kierkegaard and below Martin Heidegger, who try to describe German angst, what we see in German angst as a way of categorizing of the future in opposition to the past. So what is the future? It is what we're headed towards. So the timeline goes into one direction and we're moving towards that future. And in addition, in contrast to the past, the future is open. Why is the future important for determining fear? It's because we can only be afraid of what is to happen in the future. We cannot be afraid of what happened in the past because it is done and over with. It can, of course, come back and show up again in the future because something in the future might come up that is a consequence of what we didn't do well in the past, and we can be afraid of that as well. But this is, again, being afraid of the future. So the point is we're always afraid of the future and the existential philosophers coining what was to become German angst later on, take this as a leitmotif, i.e. the future being open. So there are so many opportunities opening up in the future. We've got a present, we've got a past, but there are so many options at hand in the future that are confronted, we are confronted with. And as a consequence of these two categories of the future being open and um, being afraid in reacting to it, philosophers then tend to believe, in particular Kierkegaard believes, that fear is just a mind-boggling um, panoply of opportunities we are presented with. And it is very important to bear in mind that all these options and opportunities just trigger that fear according to this interpretation. So it's not about how the future turns out in particular and about how we judge it, but it's the mere fact that the future is there and it is open. So this is this German angst which is pervasive, it is constant, it will stay around as long as we've got a future to come. This is the idea behind it and this is why it takes a very systematic and central place in Martin Heidegger's existential philosophy. So according to that characterization of fear, a rational way of judging fear is not possible because it is not directed towards specific future events, but it is geared towards the fact that the future is there anyhow. And another consequence is that we are skeptical about the future or that we're fending off the future. We, don't, we are reluctant to have it. And this is often the connotation of German angst and about a reticent way of acting in 
this culture. As for me, I'm not quite sure whether this is a legitimate way of defining the notion of fear or angst, because in particular, when, as soon as we know what's going to happen, we can still be afraid. So the openness of future is not necessary, and it is not sufficient and indispensable for us feeling fear. But what I'd like to do today is to underline another approach related to fear. So the future is something coming towards us, in the metaphoric sense of the term. So we are confronted to that future, and the future is coming towards us automatically. And the consequence of this concept is to be that the fear of the future also depends on what we expect from the future, what we expect to happen, and how we gauge that future. And I'm going to tell you more about this in a bit. And it means that fear also confronts us with a lot more of an openness and is much less restricted than German angst that we, I just outlined before. And I'd like to suggest that we can also rationally categorize fear in a way. So fear is rational whenever it corresponds to a rational risk or a rational risk assessment in a certain way. I'll pick up on that more in a bit. Let me mention a couple of terms and definitions. So the way I see fear or angst is that feeling of threat, being threatened by the future. And the risk assessment would then be to assess this possibility of experiencing a negative event. And the opposite of that risk assessment is the opportunity. And the opposite of fear is not confidence, to my mind, but it's joyful anticipation. So this moves closer to an opposite to my mind. But I will focus on fear and risk rather. But anything I'm going to tell you about it can also be adapted appropriately and can also be grasped by those positive notions of joyful anticipation of what or opportunity. Second remark, fear is not something bad in itself, or at least I believe that it is not something bad in itself. Um, Neither is joyful anticipation something good or positive, which means that the calls that are made on us to display optimism, to be confident and positive about the future, I believe that in individual case, this is something that can be appropriate, but it's not always adequate, and we need to differentiate here. And today, I'll pretty much focus on how we can actually carry out this differentiation. Let me first talk about risk and the question as to how we can gauge and assess our future risk in a structural way. And the graph that I just showed you before in the context of existential philosophy, looking at the future, was that there are a couple of true events that are actually happening and also a couple of opportunities. You can see those four futures presenting themselves to us. It doesn't really show up in that picture as it was originally planned, but existential philosophy does not look into the specifics, specifics of these futures. And this is what I consider to be a problem of this specific conception because it uh, blindsides us when it comes to the future that is imminent or that we might expect to happen. It's not necessarily something negative, which means that we have a tendency towards characterizing those futures. When I were to think of my own future, and when I were to think about next year, just regardless of what's happening in the coronavirus pandemic, there might be several opportunities. Two are that I will go on a marathon next year, and there's also a chance of me taking on two more kilos. And these are maybe two options that exclude themselves, uh, rule out themselves, but still I can take them for granted, these two different options. And they need to be differentiated. They need to be distinguished because they are not of the same quality. I would rather see Wolfgang Freitag, who in 2021 takes part in marathon instead of having one that would take on two kilos of weight. Uh, so this is quite uh, straightforward. You can also build examples for yourself. So we can assess the future relating to how the futures 
present themselves to us. And the second appraisal level for coming to grips with a future is that those future options are maybe possible, but possibilities are not all the same. There are different degrees of likelihood or possibilities, so there are things that are more likely than others. And to be more outspoken, some things have a greater likelihood to happen. So to stick to my examples, the two options are of course possible me taking part in a marathon or putting on two more kilos, but unfortunately the latter is very much more likely. So when appraising and assessing the future, we can look at different options, different futures, and evaluating them in terms of how likely they are and what is the added value that they can bring to us. And when doing so and when depicting that, in this representation, we can easily determine, with the help of a ponderation of likelihoods, so an easy formula in evaluation, so whenever we sum these evaluations up, we will come up with an expectation for a future, it's an expectation value, and we can think about whether this future option is something that we feel positive about or negative about. So some of you might be familiar with that from the rationality theory might have come across it, but whenever you form such an expectation value, you can speak of a risk when the expectation value is lower than zero and it's an opportunity if it's bigger than zero. And when you're when doing so, we cannot just talk, talk about categories such as risk and opportunity and chance, or we can or have different degrees of opportunities and risks. So you'll get that straight away. And just to illustrate this by way of an example, please imagine that your future looks like this. So regardless of what's happening in the coronavirus pandemic, so you might uh, go on a skiing holiday and there are two options. Either you'd go for the Alps or you would rather opt for the Black Forest because you, you are a skier who likes to ski off uh, the uh, regular uh, snowfields and yeah, there's also a danger of uh, ending up in an avalanche of the tracks. So you have to gauge the danger of you being hit by an avalanche or not, and you have to also derive your own conclusion for, from that appraisal. So let's take it that you think the Alps are much more interesting than the Black Forest, and maybe there is more snow as well, snow is guaranteed in the Alps, much more so than in the Black Forest, so both are good, both values are good, but you like the Alps better, and let's take it that uh, you think that avalanches in the Alps are more dangerous than avalanches occurring in the Black Forest, so this is why the Alps avalanche gets a more negative uh, value than the one in the Black Forest. And take it that the likelihood of you being hit by an avalanche in the Alps is twice as high, probably, than in the Black Forest. So if you were to do the math here, of course, this is just a simplified model, but stripped down model, but you, it can be generalized, and then your future might look quite rosy. So regardless of where you're going, the future is something bright and shiny, and you can, or you should, uh, be happy about what's to come. And if you were to decide you would rather opt for the Alps instead of the Black Forest, because the Alps get a higher value than the Black Forest, of course, the uh, possibility of you being hit by avalanche is something potentially negative. I mean, you're not uh, risking your life uh, and you're not going to accept this experience of being in an avalanche at some point. This is not what you wish to do, but this does not really have a real negative impact on the overall result for you. Okay, so this is just a basic model of how we can evaluate and assess the future and how we can also gauge uh, opportunities and risks for the future according to that model. And my question now is what does all this have to do with rationality or how can we take it from this appraisal model uh, that there is rationality or irrationality? So when are people rational or irrational when they carry out these assessments. So the expectation likelihood is composed of two factors. First of all, of likelihoods, and second, of assessments or appraisals that I just uh, outlined to you. And you can also look at them separately, and you can examine them whether they are fit for rationality or not. And if you look at likelihoods, then there is something very clearly right or wrong, and also rational or irrational. My predecessor, Mr. Bandelow just uh, 
mentioned it, we're often wrong about the likelihood of events occurring. So people come from northern Germany, travel to the Alps, and they have never heard about avalanches or the risk of avalanches, probably, and they tend to underestimate the danger. They think the weather is great, great snow, great slopes. Why are there supposed to be avalanches? So here it's quite plain to see that uh, this assessment of the expectation value is uh, also conducive to uh, rationality or irrationality outcome, uh, referring to those likelihoods. And of course, experts play an important role in the Alps. There are experts that determine the avalanche risk every day in most of the skiing zones. So but what about the evaluation then? So here, the situation is quite different. Evaluations are purely subjective and individual. They are, they are nothing that can be rational corroborated or corrected. So evaluations in that sense are just irrational. They've got no irrational. They've got nothing to do with rationality. So whether I like the Alps better than the Black Forest because I uh, find them more impressive or whether I prefer the Black Forest because I like it cozy and nice and this is maybe down to your own taste or an aesthetic question or maybe it depends on how adventurous a guy you are but it's nothing that you can assess or gauge rationally. Um, right, and that's important to me because uh, when we're talking about the question of decisions and which decisions would be the correct ones or the right ones, and in democracies, for example, also the question of which role experts should play, then I'd say, apart from some special cases, experts have a very important role to fulfill by offering advice when it comes to evaluating and assessing uh, likelihoods. For example, important also for uh, political decision makers. And uh, of course, it's extremely difficult. We all know that when looking into the newspapers in times of corona, not even the experts are of a single mind. They don't agree, and we don't know which measures lead to which consequences, but they still know a lot better about these things than the layperson would. So they have a very important role to play, and it was also mentioned already here. You know, among others, also the role of scientists and sciences. But on the other hand, we cannot leave everything to experts, especially not when it comes to assessing and evaluating possible futures. That is something that needs to be decided upon in an aggregating manner in a democracy in some way. But this is not something that an expert could determine ex cathedra. And it's very important because it identifies identifies the legitimate and the illegitimate roles of experts in democracies very clearly. But let me not go into further detail here because there is something else that I'd like to still talk about and that is the term or the concept of fear. Because so far I've only talked about risks. Now how is this um, connected to fear and anxiety? Well, if we look at the assessment or the evaluation of futures, what are the contributing factors? Well, everything that would either turn the future into something positive or negative for me. That is happiness, pain, suffering, you know, uh, lust, uh, certain feelings or anxieties and other things, and, but especially also, you know, fear or joy in the future. So fear also plays a major role. If I go, for example, on holiday in a country where I think that I might be afraid all the time, then, of course, uh, this uh, holiday is something that we would assess to be more negative, uh, you know, even prospectively, than a comparable a holiday without that element of fear. Now, of course, we could now assume that because fear and joy are already part of my evaluation of the future, that uh, whenever there is a risk that can be identified or whether there is a real uh, possibility of a risk that, uh, or, you know, or, or opportunities there are that we might experience fear and um, anticipation, you know. So the fears that we have and our assessment of the future, do these always correlate really to our, um, you know, take on risks and opportunities? And I would say that there is no such correlation. To just give you one example, you know, um, and we've already heard comparable examples in previous uh, speeches here, well, just assume that you'd be planning those holidays with a, another person, a friend or a partner, and uh, you've got the same kind of uh, things, you know, in terms of the alternative you know, holidays in the Black Forest or in the Alps, you've got the same assessments, the same likelihoods for the different kinds of events that may occur, then it might still be that your friend has, um, you know, 
a fear of avalanches. They might be afraid of uh, you know, being buried by an avalanche. Perhaps they've read too much about that. Perhaps they know that they would panic very quickly. For such a person, the objectively low likelihood of avalanches you know, that is, of course, the negativity of this unlikely event, uh, you know, is being elevated to entirely different dimensions. So the assessment or the evaluation of fear, you know, in terms of uh, what my emotions are when thinking about the future, this does not necessarily have to correlate to the value of expectation that I would get when looking at the future without taking into account my current fears and anxieties. And I think that is a very important point when talking about fear. And it's also a point that has been raised here, at least indirectly, in other presentations. Now the question is, if uh, we now look at fears and anxieties with a view to the future, can we then still talk about the, you know, these fears being rational? Well, I'd say that the fears or the anxieties themselves are not rational, probably, I don't know. I mean, they are part of our personality. However, they may have, uh, you know, become part of our personalities, you know, as part of our brains or development, and or whether they are really based on true experiences. But these fears just exist. That is not something that could be called rational or irrational, just looking at them in isolation. But if you think back of what I already talked about, you know, I talked about two different ways of evaluating the future. One was an evaluation or an assessment for, in terms of the quality of the future, subjectively, for me, always depending on the assumed likelihoods. But the other one was the emotional assessment of the different possible futures. So two different assessments or evaluations of the same subject matter, that is the possible future. And that also allows us to look at uh, you know, joyful anticipation or fear and examine them in terms of their rational or irrational aspects and their importance as compared to the real risk. Now, of course, you can ask yourselves right away what does that mean and how am I supposed to you know, compare such an assessment with a feeling? Well, I think, you know, pre-theoretically, we could say that we've got a very good connection to that. We could say that this fear is not proportionate to a certain situation or is not appropriate in a certain situation. And I think there are other principles that we can formulate. If, for example, two situations have the same kind of assessment, uh, or are being assessed in the same way, then the fear or the joyful anticipation in terms of uh, reactions should be comparable. And you can also turn it around. In order to have something like a correspondence between fear and risk, or uh, you know, a general assessment and a risk assessment in terms of what to expect. So, fear and joyful anticipation, or you know, optimism, confidence, confidence can be seen as rational or uh, irrational if you actually look at whether they correspond to the expectations uh, of your anticipation, and indirectly by asking whether the function of likelihood, or rather the values of likelihood that also form part of our expectation, whether these values are correct, whether we actually look at the situation and determine its factuality correctly. So these are two parameters that we can actually review when uh, asking ourselves whether a fear in itself can be called rational or not. But if we look at the assessment functionality, that is B, that is whether we expect something positive or negative to happen, this is something that I think cannot be judged uh, according to the rules of rationality to begin with. But if we now think about what we can do and how we can deal with fear and anxiety, and then let's take a look first at the easy tasks. First of all, I think we should not be afraid of this particular fear. This fear is geared towards the future and it reacts to to the future. It may in some situation be comparatively irrational, like we just uh, described it, but it still is something that is specifically geared towards uh, specific possibilities of the future. On the more constructive side, you could also possibly say that with this fear, you, you could deal with this fear in a rational way, and you could perhaps partially eliminate it, and one point has been mentioned here today, and that is the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is whether our fears are actually based on rational uh, 
um, assessments of likelihood. Do we have all the necessary data or do we exaggerate our expectation, for example, of mortality rates or you know, the economic risks of certain situations, etc.? That is very important, I think, and this is a task that we have to constantly apply ourselves to if we really want to learn how to deal constructively, both with fear as well as with joyful anticipation. A second step is still a comparatively easy one. We can compare whether our fear corresponds to our assessment of risks, at least if we are reflecting personalities. We can look at whether our emotional reactions are not an exaggeration as compared to the real assessment of a perceived risk. So we can at least try and evaluate uh, the comparative value of this irrationality. These are the simple tasks. They are simple because they're theoretically simple, not uh, in practical terms. Rational likelihoods are very hard to determine, and I already tried to point that out, especially when we're talking about the future developments. For example, in the corona situation, you know, then uh, in terms of what our measures that we adopt uh, will bring in the future. And now the difficult uh, task is, and here I'm actually coming late uh, by at least one presentation, because Mr. Bundle already alluded to how to solve this problem, but the difficult task would be to change fears or change uh, joyful anticipation and to, or to adapt the risk to the real life risk profile. So, you know, we can make overblown fears shrink and, uh, you know, perhaps get the uh, fear that is just not strong enough to actually take its rightful place. Thank you very much. Perhaps you can come up with some questions now. Thank you very much, Professor Freitag. Let's move on with the next question. You are talking about rational fears, is the question of one person. Wouldn't we... Um, call that different in German, furcht, that is a specific fear geared towards one thing. We just heard that, you know, there are certain elements in our brain that cannot be influenced by the rational part of our brain. So, um, is it, uh, you know, just fear or is it dread? You know, um, I mean, of course, if we are materialists, you know, that we may be thinking that everything is being done by the brain and that is also something that's being done by the brain. So all of these things seem to have be rooted in our brain. And in that respect, they are also produced, if you will, by our brains. So that is one possible position in this discussion here. But we can still, you know, look at them using tools of rationality, you know. Just like we can look at convictions with the tools of uh, rationality, because our convictions are also products of our brain, if you want to follow that model. But still, you might want to say that some people's convictions are very irrational. Donald Trump, for example, is irrational uh, in many of his convictions, uh, you know, in my point of view. He's very authentic. That is why he was elected. And I'm hoping he won't be elected tomorrow. I think the election is over tomorrow, I, if I'm correctly informed, yes. So I think that he's irrational in terms of his convictions, uh, at least very frequently so. So we can do this rationality assessment even if we assume that the psychological feature, feats are, you know, feats of our brain. But of course there is the, also the question of, uh, you know, whether you're able to influence things. I believe that we can also even influence our convictions in a rational manner. We're doing that when, for example, discussing things with others or thinking about things uh, all by ourselves, you know, when and trying to find arguments for or against certain things. So I try to enlighten people in this respect, and I'm also very optimistic in this respect. But I also believe that there are other influencing factors that can come into play. It could, for example, be possible to influence things with the help of medical drugs. Or, you know, that there are also other possible ways of reducing overblown fears or to actually get a fear that is not developed enough to really you know, be proportionate to the real situation, as the previous speaker already alluded to. Well, you in your presentation also talked about the important role of experts and the importance of expert knowledge, concrete mathematical calculations of likelihoods, for example, but how can you differentiate or, you know, set apart the real experts from the self-declared experts? You know, we're talking about the trustworthiness of experts. There is also discussion of the cacophony of different uh, want-to-be experts. How can we deal with that situation? Well, I think in general terms, you know, uh, the truth is that you can't always differentiate. 
along those lines because it sometimes is not really clear who the expert is, especially for events that cannot be modeled upon examples from the past, you know, where you've got tried and tested approaches. Perhaps in two or three years we will be rather more knowledgeable about who was the real expert today. And that is very difficult, of course, but let me say, first of all, experts normally have more technical expertise and knowledge to offer and uh, to also make part of their assessment. Uh, so they have better possibilities of weighing different facts as compared to a lay person. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Feitag, for your presentation and for answering our questions. Thank you very much indeed.